Support for Knowledge Stream is provided in part by a generous gift from the Appold Family Charitable Trust. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you, for, thank you, John, for inviting me, and thank you for having me. Um, so, um, John essentially introduced um, the reason why I feel like um, myself as a scientist, I need to reach out to the public and and talk about these things. Uh, CRISPR-Cas is a is a in gene editing in general is a very powerful phenomenon, um, but with power comes great responsibility, and so. Um, he already uh, mentioned um, what hit the news and which I think um, surprised and shocked many in the scientific community, but perhaps it shouldn't, and surprised and was an issue of great concern for people in, in society in general. And that was that in late November, it was announced that a Chinese scientist had used gene editing to alter human beings. He worked together with an in vitro fertilization clinic in China. Um, and he used gene editing to alter at least two human beings. Um, and this, uh, two days before um, it leaked, two days before this conference at which he's pictured, um, it was announced uh, by the newspapers. And then two days later, um, November 28th, he's, he was at a scientific conference and discussing his results. And I think you can see a lot from the body language of what's going on here. Um, the Chinese scientist who did the gene editing is in the center, and I think he is uh, a little overwhelmed. I think he was expecting a hero's welcome. And um, uh, Matthew Porteous, who works on gene editing, is trying to use it to cure people of sickle cell and anemia. Um, is very unhappy and looks like he wants to disappear. Badge is, is querying um, the Chinese doctor about uh, what, is on, what he's done and um, why he did it. So to be clear about what was done in this instance, uh, human embryos were altered, fertilized eggs were injected with gene editing components. And a gene was knocked out with the hope of generating individuals who would be resistant to HIV infection. Um, this is what we call germline gene editing. Because these reagents are being injected into the fertilized egg, and all of those genes then give rise to all the cells of the body, including those that will give rise to the next generation, all those cells have been altered, ideally. OK, so this not only affects this individual that was born from this fertilized egg, but it also affects their offspring. Okay, so that was his goal. When we look at issues of new technologies and new treatments in science and medicine, we use a set of ethical principles that are largely embodied in the Hippocratic Oath. Here, they're broken down into bullet points. So the principles of med medical ethics that we use to decide on whether things like this should have been done are questions of autonomy, non-malfeasance, beneficence, justice, and alternatives. So autonomy means, did the person this involved, did the person who this procedure involved, did they have a say in what was happening? Did they have informed consent? Non-malfeasance means, first, do no harm. We don't, if we're trying to do good, we also want to do no harm if possible. Beneficence is doing no harm. Justice, is this something that disrupts equity in our society or in the world? And then lastly, are there better alternatives that can be used in the case of this? And I think, in general, we agreed upon, in fact, after the NIH, immediately made a statement and pointed out all the ways in which this study fell, fell short of our ethical norms. Um, how can a fertilized egg be used informed consent? How can a fertilized egg be consent to the procedure that was done to it? How can the future generations consent to this? And perhaps it's affecting all of us in society. We surely should have a say in, in it. 
doing no harm. He knocked out a gene that is thought to be a receptor for the, for the HIV virus that causes AIDS. And so that was his goal, to do good by making individuals that are resistant to developing this disease. So that goal was good. But that gene is also, we know, is necessary for preventing infection by other viruses. Um, this procedure was done by in vitro fertilization. So he had to get the cooperation of an um, IVF clinic to do this. And so IVF clinics are only available to, to those that can pay. So this is really uh, in keeping with our ideas of justice and, and equity. And then the last point in, in terms of alternatives, certainly there are alter alternatives to germline editing in this case and making a new kind of human being. There are very effective treatments, very effective regimens of antivirals that can be used to treat people with uh, HIV that work very well and are extending the lifespan of people. And so perhaps there's no justification from that point of view either. That ethical dis discussion that only takes place before we leap into a new therapy really never took place. And so this individual wanted to be the first to conduct this procedure. He wanted to be a pioneer. And so he conducted his experiments in secret. And the reports are that, is that it never really underwent an ethical review. So they do have ethical review at Chinese hospitals, Chinese uh, when new things are done, but they just sort of defrauded the whole process. So the ethical review never happened. Just this week, four days ago, um, a group of prominent scientists from around the world, including many of those who created CRISPR Cas or were among the, the, the first pioneers in CRISPR Cas, proposed a five year moratorium on germline gene editing, in essence what he has done here of altering an entire human being and future generations. And the NIH has agreed to this, and the NIH also seeks to regulate IVF clinics. This altering of a human germline is not something you can do at home in your basement. Um, it requires, you know, all the infrastructure that's associated and all the expertise that's associated with an IVF clinic. And so there's clearly a, a point there at which we can have um, um, uh, regulation, if necessary, to make sure that nothing like this happens again. To get out of the five-year moratorium, each nation then has to consider what their goals are, and each nation perhaps can go in, in on their own way. But I think initially, we, across the international scientific community, we have to agree um, on, on what what, the, what it looks like. If we really want to go in this direction, what does it look like and what would justify it? And this is the most important slide of all. It's about you. And that is, is that the public, the informed public and the society at large are the people who will make the decisions about whether we go ahead with things like this or not. Okay? And so we... As scientists need to be moral, undergo ethical review, I also feel like I need to reach out to people and say, this is how it works. This is the science of CRISPR-Cas and gene editing. But ultimately, it is society, it is you and the public that make the decision of whether, whether this is, is uh, acceptable or not. So in the question period, we can come back to that, germline gene editing. But first, I want to talk to you about the way most scientists see this in terms of treating disease, in terms of treating genetic disease, using a specific example of cystic fibrosis, a genetic disease that I work on, and what our hopes are for this. So I'm going to describe cystic fibrosis, what the disease is, what somatic gene editing is as opposed to germline gene editing, what the hurdles to actually accomplishing this are, and then at, an end, at the end we can talk about whether somatic gene editing for cystic fibrosis and other genetic diseases is justified. So cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease. It's inherited. There are about um, one in 3,000 people of Caucasian origin every year 
uh, who are born are born with cystic fibrosis. Many years ago in the 1950s, these, these babies that were born with cystic fibrosis would die immediately. Um, once the disease was recognized, um, treatments immediately began, and the, the lives of, of people treated who have cystic fibrosis has been improving since the 1950s. So if you know anything about cystic fibrosis, you think of it as a lung disease. But it wasn't the lung disease that was killing these babies. It was the fact that they had problems, they had intestinal obstructions, and they didn't have pancreatic enzymes that would help them digest the food. And so, in fact, although we think of cystic fibrosis as a lung disease, it affects many organs in the body. It affects the pancreas. It affects the intestines. It affects growth, probably independent from, from nutrition. And it affects the lungs. <clears throat> and so, as we go through this, as we talk about gene editing and the possibility of correcting this gene, we're going to sort of zoom in from the disease as it is all the way down to the gene to try to see what the hurdles are to trying to correct this. The idea of the way we would try to correct this is by what we call somatic gene editing. So if this disease, the patients that now have it are pr predominantly affected by their lungs, so current patients, the other treatments we give them, cure many of their, their gut problems and other issues, but their lung disease is still the thing that kills them, then we need to treat the lungs. And so the idea of somatic gene editing is rather than treating every cell in the body, including future generations, we will gene edit only those cells in the affected tissue. And so that's the difference between somatic gene editing and germline gene editing. Okay. And so do we want to go this direction? So in the case of cystic fibrosis, it affects the large conducting airways, shown in red here. And so one way of doing this would be to take our gene editors and package them in some sort of delivery vehicle, some sort of um, um, uh, uh, means to get them into cells. Perhaps we could aerosolize them, deliver them to the lungs, and then these delivery vehicles could deliver the gene editors into the cells, and we get correction of the cystic fibrosis mutation in those cells, and their lung disease would go away. And perhaps in the future, um, we can also look to correcting other organs as well, the pancreas and the gut. In contrast, germline gene editing would be to either treat sperm or eggs or fertilized eggs and do the gene editing there and then alter every cell in the body and including the germline of future generations. And so that's the distinction. And in somatic gene editing, we're trying to limit it to the affected organs and such that the future generations won't be affected. OK, so that's the goal, to correct by gene editing this disease gene in the affected organs. So what are the challenges? Basically, the challenges can be broken down into two bullet points, the first being delivery, getting the gene editors into the cells of the adult body. If we're dealing with a fertilized egg, we just take a microinjection pipette and we inject them right into the egg. In the cells of the body, we have many, many, many cells, and they have many barriers. Okay, so our airways have air coming into them all the time. There can be particles and, and infectious agents coming in with the air, and so our lungs protect themselves from all those from the environment. So, can we deliver the gene editors into those adult lung cells while getting around all of those defenses that our lung cells have against the environment? The other problem is correcting, in some cases, only one letter of our genetic code, one base out of 3.2 billion. Okay, So we're going to do one of those astronomical things. We're going to start, usually they start small and go big. We're going to start big and go small all the way down to that single nucleotide. Okay. 
So this is a diagram of an adult uh, with the conducting airways in red. So we have a trachea that then breaks up into bronchi and then bronchioles and then further branches like that. And if you take a cross section through one of those airways, what you see is that there's a layer of muscle on the outside, there's cells, there's mucus then protecting those cells from the air. Okay. And the cells of the airway, they have cilia on it that beat and move the mucus up towards our mouth where we cough it out. That mucus is a protective layer, so particles and viruses and bacteria get caught in it. And there's just a simple mechanical means for removing that mucus from our lungs, coughing it out. First it's waved up by the cilia, and then we cough it out and we, get, we help get rid of things that way. In cystic fibrosis, that mucus is different. It is much thicker. It doesn't flow properly. Essentially, it's dehydrated. To get right down into the molecular details of it, the gene that is mutant in cystic fibrosis, it is a channel for ions. And where the ions go, the water goes. We don't have this channel anymore, so we have less water. Our mucus, the mucus of cystic fibrosis patients is dehydrated. It's thick, it's sticky, it plugs some of the bronchioles and so they can't get air into those cells and parts of their lungs. It also traps bacteria of different sorts and there's this constant cycle of infection and inflammation and clearance followed by more infection and inflammation and eventually the tissue around it begins to change. Okay, so in this case, the airway has constricted some, the muscle has grown thicker, and so eventually it leads to severe problems in breathing. If we continue to zoom in on our way to the gene, the cells along these tubes, the bronchioles, if we zoom in on them, we see over here on your right, the air at the top, the mucus layer then separating the, the air from the cells, different cell types, some blue cells at the bottom, and then our muscle cells there. Okay, and so these peach colored cells over here with the, 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 the brush cut on top of them, those are the cilia that are moving the mucus up towards the mouth. The cells that we want to deliver our gene editor to are the blue cells at the bottom, the furthest from the air. And the reason why we want to deliver our gene editor to those blue cells is that they are the stem cells. Okay, they're the stem cells, they're the cells that produce all the other cells that are functional, that are facing the air. So in the case of cystic fibrosis, those cells are turning over, they're dying, they're being replaced, and they're re being replaced by daughter cells from these blue cells, the basal cells, the stem cells. And so if we were to get our gene editor into just these cells, just underneath the mucus layer, a lot of those cells are going to die. Okay, they're going to turn over and they're going to be replaced by basal cells that we haven't gene edited. So to gene edit and get a lasting response from a single treatment, what we want to get into is those basal cells and we want to get our, our gene editors in there. Sure. Okay. If we look inside the nucleus of a single basal cell, each cell then has a genome. Here are all the chromosomes, half of them anyways. We have tw you know, um, all of these that then add up to 3.2 billion um, letters in our genetic code. And here is chromosome 7, the chromosome on which the, the disease gene is. If we zoom in further then on chromosome 7, chromosome 7 is 159 million bases. The gene then that is changed in cystic fibrosis is called CFTR. That gene itself has 254,000 bases. And then here is a CF mutation, one change in 3.2 billion letters. 
This is actual sequence from the CF gene. The other sequences I'll show in the future are just demonstration sequences, but this is one here. And this mutation then, this change in the code, prevents the protein, prevents the functional, the gene from functioning. So the protein is not produced. This is a premature stop codon. And we want to correct this, 1 in 3.2 billion. OK, so the challenges are we need to deliver the gene editor to the basal cells. And once we deliver it to them, we need our gene editor to find that 1.1 in 3.2 billion and change it specifically and not just mutagenize the whole genome. We want to make that very specific change. And so surprisingly, the easy part of these two appears to be the latter, the 1 in 3.2 billion because of CRISPR-Cas. So CRISPR-Cas9 is the way in which, through gene editing, we can change that 1 in 3.2 billion. OK. So in essence, once we get the gene editor in the cell, then we want it to find that particular change and change it, that particular change in, in our genome. OK. So I'm going to take you through the actual mechanism by which this works, but the way by CRISPR-Cas works, OK? And we can do this because everyone has a basic understanding of DNA. We know that there are two strands to it, that there are four letters, A, C, G, and T, and they pair up. So it's a very simple code, OK? And so what has happened in this gene is that we've gotten a change somewhere, and we want to put it back to normal. One of these letters has changed. We want to change it. For understanding CRISPR-Cas9, what you need to know basically is that we have pairing between particular letters that bring the two strands together, and those two strands can separate. Okay? So DNA zips up and it unzips, and that's a reversible process. Okay. So you knew that already. What you may not know is that DNA can also pair with RNA, a related molecule. In RNA, the Ts are replaced by Us, but it's essentially the same sort of code, plays by the same rules. And so if the DNA unwinds, making some of those letters available for pairing, then an RNA molecule can come in and pair with it as well. And that is also reversible. Okay. And that's all you need to know to understand CRISPR-Cas, because into the cell, the cell has got double-stranded DNA like this, and we put two components into it a protein called Cas9, part of that CRISPR-Cas9 story, Cas9, and with it goes an RNA molecule that we call a guide RNA. And this is something that's got a part that's always the same, and so this is the part that the Cas9 protein binds to. And so if that part is on this RNA, Cas9 protein binds it up. And then this is the part that we design. We put in a code there that will match a sequence, the letters of the DNA, that we want to that matches the letters that we want to target. OK? So the first thing that Cas9 does is it binds to the DNA, and it looks for a very simple sequence. It looks for GG. Everywhere it finds a GG, it binds it, and it stops. Okay? So you can look at this sequence here, and if you look at the top strand, uh, there's two GGs. There's one that's AGG in red, and then right at the end, there's a GG. Okay? And on the bottom strand, no GGs. Okay? But there could be some as well. And so Cas9 will go and find a GG and recognize it and bind to it in double-stranded DNA. That's the first step. If it finds a GG, it introduces a little bit of melting, a little bit of unzipping right next to that GG. Okay? And so because of interactions with the protein, these, this lower strand of DNA melts away from the DNA, and the bases swing free, and they're approaching the letters of the guide RNA. And if those letters in the guide RNA match 
the ones are complementary to are ones that can pair with the DNA, they pair up with each other. Okay, and so now we've got a little bit more melting in the DNA. And if the complete sequence of the guide RNA matches the rest of that strand of DNA, it completely melts that strand of DNA. Okay, so what was paired with DNA is now paired with RNA. Okay, so things had to happen, and they had to happen in order. The first thing is Cas9 had to find GG. And then when nucleotide downstream of that, it melts one part of the DNA. And if that then can pair with the RNA, then the process continues and it can try to pair with the rest of the RNA. And if all of those things happen and happen in order, then Cas9 cuts the DNA, as shown here by the arrows. Okay. So what we've done then is we've cut the DNA. And so I'm sure you've heard that Cas9 is a molecular scissors that cuts DNA. This is the way in which it does it. And what we've done then is we've guided those scissors to a very specific part in the genome. Essentially, we have a 23-letter code. We have the GG, one base which doesn't matter, and then another 20 bases. So essentially, it's a 23 base pair address, a 23-letter code that is enough information to be unique to our genome. Okay? So we have a sequence genome. We can look at that sequence. We can pick a GG and then 21 nucleotides next to it. And we can design and very simply make a guide RNA. And this allows us, by being able to make these RNAs very simply, combine them with you know, Cas9 protein that we buy from off the shelf, we can then combine the two of these, put them into a cell, and get them to cut that DNA at a very only one site in the genome if we picked our site appropriately. Okay. It's very easy for scientists and companies to make RNAs, and so we can do this. We can do this to any place in our genome that has a unique 23 nucleotide sequence. Okay. Cas9 and the guide RNA fall away, and we're left with a double strand break. We've broken the DNA here. We've cut it specifically just at one place in the genome. So, so what? Where does the magic happen? Well, the magic happens is that Cas9 and the guide RNA are still there in the cell. And our cells are actually very, very good at repairing DNA, and they do it precisely. And so most of the time, the cell is going to take this pattern, on this, this, this pathway on the right-hand side. They're going to precisely repair that. And Cas9, if it's still there, is going to cut it again. Because the information for Cas9 to still cut it is still there. What happens in the way that we can alter the DNA is that if there's a rare error, if there's a rare error in repairing that DNA and we change the sequence, now Cas9 can no longer cut the DNA. Okay, so this exits out of that infinite loop. The changes that happen here most often are random or more or less random. And so we've made a nonspecific sort of random change to the gene. So by and large, on average, we're going to break that gene. So I can't come to you promising great things, and all I'm doing is breaking things. OK, so that sucks. Um, but we can still use this. And in fact, the first clinical trials for somatic gene editing using CRISPR-Cas and other nucleases is using this gene-breaking phenomenon. So sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemias are disorders, genetic diseases that affect our uh, blood cells of those people that are affected. They are specific mutations in the globin genes. And what we would like to do eventually is to correct those changes, correct those mutations specifically. But we're quite not, not quite ready there to do that. We can do it, but we're not quite ready to try it in patients. But we know from the therapies that are used to treat people with beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia that those drugs, what they do is they activate the fetal globin genes in those people. 
And so what we do, what they're doing right now, what that Matthew Porteous in that first slide was, do, was trying to do, was then to break a gene, and that gene then keeps those fetal globin genes on. So sort of replicating what the drug treatments for these people already do and doing it genetically. Okay? So breaking in a gene in this case is good. Okay? We're breaking a gene then that keeps the fetal globin genes off. We're only doing it in their blood cells. Okay. And we do that by taking bone marrow from these patients, putting the gene editors into them, putting the bone marrow cells or blood cells back into them, and now, hopefully, if these clinical trials succeed, these people will be as good as treated by drugs, but they'll only have one treatment. Yep? But earlier on, how do you, how do you find out which So we know that the gene that we're knocking out in this case is not the, the, the gene that's causing the disease. We're not correcting it. We're, we're knocking out another gene. So it's different in this case. The way that it's found initially was um, people did old, old school genetics. They mapped it, and then they sequenced the genome of these people or sequenced the genes of these people. And so it's been known for a long time what what the specific causes of some of these genetic diseases are. They've been studied for, for decades. Okay, so I hope I've shown you how Cas9 works, how it cuts DNA, and how cutting to, to D DNA can wreck a gene. Okay, but we really want to correct genes because there aren't that many genetic diseases that we can treat by knocking out another gene. What we want to do is correct the gene that causes the, the disease. And so ideally, with sickle cell, we want to correct that specific mutation that causes sickle cell. For the beta thalassemias, we want to correct those specific mutations. And also for cystic fibrosis, we want to correct the specific changes that those particular patients have. Okay. So, I'm going to, there have been various ways that this has been tried, and um, I'm only going, going to talk about the latest version of this. Okay, so there have been other ways that have been discovered where we can make precise replacements, but those methods which use that double strand break, which cut the DNA, um, they add in another piece of DNA, the problem with those approaches is that they most often break the gene. We get about one in 10 times, we get a correction, but usually we break the gene. And so it's very frustrating. It's okay in the lab, if we're working with cells, we can get rid of the cells, throw out the cells that, that have broken genes and only keep the ones that have the corrected genes. But we don't wanna do that, that's not acceptable for patients. We wanna correct all of their genes and not have any broken genes. And so I think the approach that has had the most promise for actual use in patients is something that's called base editing. Okay, so going from gene editing to something very similarly named called base editing. So on the top, we have the sequence of a gene, and then on the bottom, we have the DNA with the gene with a one small change causing the disease. And so we want to change this C on the top strand of the lower diagram up to T. So the CG back to TA up at the top. I'm going to walk you through sort of um, a basic illustration of where we're going with this, okay? So a step-by-step -step way that we could change C's to T's. Our goal here is to change a C to a T, okay? So here we have double-stranded DNA, and the first step is for me to highlight the C's on the upper strand. So there are two C's on the upper strand. The first thing we're going to do is what we learned at the beginning, we're gonna unwind the DNA. And so now we have single-stranded DNA, it's no longer base pair. We're gonna forget about that lower strand of DNA, it just disappeared from our minds. Now we've unwinded D the DNA and we have two Cs. We're gonna change, wave our magic wand over them and change those Cs to Ts. So all Cs change to T. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have DNA synthesis come in and make the other strand of DNA. DNA synthesis 
uses the information on the one strand to put in the other strand. So where there's a T, it puts in an A, and so on. So there's a T here, DNA synthesis puts in an A. There's a T here, DNA synthesis puts in an A. Okay? So not only did we change one strand, but we co-opted DNA synthesis to change both strands of DNA. And so in the end, we've gone from CG base pairs at those two places down to TA base pairs down here. Okay. There is an enzyme that can carry out this reaction of changing C's to T's. as the fancy name of cytidine di deaminase. And so this is a protein like Cas9. It is an enzyme, and it enzymatically changes C's to T's. Okay, so it's no longer a magic wand. We now have an enzyme that can do this for us. The problem with doing this is that we only want to change one specific C in the entire genome. The good thing about this cytidine deaminase, this enzyme that changes C's to T's, it can only work on single-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA, the bases are base paired with each other, and cytidine deaminase can't find its way in. Only if we have single-stranded DNA can cytidine deaminase get access to that base and change it from a C to T. Okay. So scientists said, being very creative, we have a system that can bring things to a very specific site in the genome, only one site in the genome. And if you remember, it melts the DNA and creates one single strand. And that protein was Cas9. And so we take cytidine deaminase and we graft it onto Cas9. And there are two now, two that are just one as one protein. And this is a base editor. Okay. So at the top is our CG base pair, the one specific one that we want to change. We add to the cell this different version of Cas9, Cas9 that has a cytidine deaminase grafted onto it, and we add a guide RNA that specifically guides us to this, this single place in the genome. In fact, it's so specific that this C has to be the sixth guy from the end there it's the sixth from, from, from the melted region there. And that's the only C that can be changed. Cytidine deaminase on this Cas9 fusion protein can't get access to the Cs on the other strand. It can't reach them. Plus, they're, they're base paired with the RNA. It can't get Cs elsewhere in the genome because they're in double-stranded DNA. Okay. And we use DNA synthesis then here, illustrated by the green strand, to fill in the A that should be there on the opposite strand. So the beauty of base editors is that they're incredibly specific. We can program them by changing the guide RNA, just like we did Cas9. But the benefit is we're not making that cut across all of DNA. In fact, we only cut one strand. And we're not then introducing a whole bunch of random mutations into the gene. By far, up to you know, 10 to 1 or 100 to 1, we get the corrected result as, as opposed to the random nonsense result, okay? So therapeutically, this is much better. We are doing good, in this case, at the gene level without doing any harm to the gene. We're not introducing any specific mutations. And we're leaving the rest of the genome un largely untouched because the cytidine deaminase can't get access to the rest of the DNA because it's all double-stranded. Okay. So I think that, and a lot of people think, that this is, is the, the, the way that we can do things. There are limitations to base editors. They are limited in the changes that they can make to DNA. They can only make certain changes. They can't make all of the possible changes. So if you have A, C, G, and T, there are only certain changes that it will make between one type and another. It seems very active and very specific, and as I said, there are a lot few or unintended consequences when we use this. Okay. So I think by and large, what we have then is a situation where that one in 3.2 billion problem of getting that specific base 
is a manageable problem. The biggest issue that we have is delivering those base editors or gene editors into those stem cells that are buried underneath the thick, sticky mucus, the cells that are turning over the inflammation and infection, the bacteria down into the stem cells, then to correct the gene in those cells and correct enough of them such that the disease is ameliorated. So that is the problem, really, is delivery. And so both the NIH and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is putting an enormous amount of money into teams of people to try to find ways to, to solve this delivery problem. They're putting money into the base editors and gene editors as well, but I think the assumption is, is that that's the easier problem and that's going to be solved. Okay, so we're going to have the gene editors. The problem is getting it into the tissues uh, of an adult. Okay, and that's, a, that's an issue that we're trying to tackle right now. Um, in the case of blood, where we can take bone marrow cells from a patient and get the gene editors into them, there's very little barrier there to deliver. We can take the cells out, we put them in culture, we can get the gene editors into them efficiently, we can put them back into the patient. We can't take the lung cells out of a patient, put them in culture, and put them back into the patient. That just doesn't work. So we have to find a way to deliver the gene editors to those cells. So one of the ways that we're trying to do that then is by using ways that give us a very easy readout on whether we're successful. Essentially using fluorescent proteins, green fluorescent proteins, jellyfish type fluorescing proteins that glow green to be able to identify cells where we've done this. We don't have to find them by some complicated mean. We can just see if they turn up and light up. So here on the right are cells that have um, the, the fluorescent protein in them, but they don't make it because they have the cystic fibrosis mutation upstream of them. So they cannot make it unless they're corrected. And if they're corrected by our gene editor, then we get glowing cells. Okay? And so we can see if our delivery vehicle worked just by the simple readout of light. Did we make the cells glow? Okay. So what we want to do then is we want to find ways to deliver to the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. And we need to, the biggest problem there is delivery. Clinical trials are starting in other diseases. They're ongoing already using both CRISPR-Cas and other gene editors. And so we'll soon see whether these approaches work or not in these more accessible tissues. So going back to the questions, the ethical questions of somatic gene edi editing, do we have autonomy? Do we have non-malfeasance? Do we have beneficence? Do we have justice and equity? And are there, all there, are, are there alternatives? So for cystic fibrosis, there are, in fact, beginning to be alternatives for people with cystic fibrosis. There are drugs that treat people with cystic fibrosis. And so these drugs, since 2013, have been able to be accessible or patients have been eligible, more and more patients have been eligible for these drugs over time. So in 2013, only 4% of patients were eligible. New drugs were developed, new combinations were tried. Um, younger patients, they started with older patients and started moving back into younger patients. And the expectation is, is that within a few years, 90% of cystic fibrosis patients will at least be eligible for drugs to treat their condition. The difference between someone who is treatable with a drug and someone who is not is that there are up to 2,000 different mutations, 2,000 different changes in the cystic fibrosis gene. And those, these drugs only act on genes that make some of the protein. If you don't make any protein, then you can't fix it with these drugs. And so the 10% of patients who cannot be treated with this class of drugs are those who do not make any protein. And so the goal of the cystic fibrosis mutation is, well, let's focus on that 10%. Okay, those are the people for whom there's no alternative treatment. Maybe in a perfect world, if this therapy is good and it's better than the drugs, we can move it then into the other patients, but we need to start with the 10% who have no alternative. Okay. So 
That will just get us to clinical trials, and I think it's necessary to note a sense of reality about what a clinical trial is. So clinical trials essentially are research. They're an experimental situation where we're trying a drug on a human. We do not know if it will work. Okay. And for cystic fibrosis, there have been 27 clinical trials for gene therapy. Okay. There are a lot of disappointed scientists and patients because of that. I went to a recent meeting at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and they had many of those individuals who had been part of those clinical trials, and you could see the spark of hope in their eyes again that maybe gene editing will work um, you know, with the right tools. And so I think that we're at the point where scientists are getting excited. We still have clinical trials to go through to see if this stuff really works for other conditions and for cystic fibrosis, but there is hope. Thanks. I'll take any questions. Support for Knowledge Stream is provided in part by a generous gift from the Appold Family Charitable Trust.